this is uh, making sense of incidents in the modern era, and I was trying to come up with a picture to like put on the title slide, and I ended up just going with the nice, you know, okay, how, how do we think about these problems, that sort of slide, and then I realized, you know, for some of us, this might be a better picture for how we make uh, sense of, inc of our incidents. Um, but I wanted to actually start with a quick survey, so, and I want you to keep your hands up. Um, who does retrospectives, like who does them, all right? And then who uh, 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 reads or uses the information that's produced by those retrospectives? All right, more hands go up, all right. Now, keep your hand up if you think you do them really well. Like you would be happy having them on YouTube, you would ha be happy having me research them, which, uh, which was interesting. So I, that's good, I still see some hands up here. So for those of you with your hands up that, you, that uh, you think our organization does this really well, this will be interesting for you because you'll get to see what uh, an organization that we would consider a high performer, how they do it. And then for those of you who put your hand down, you'll see, get to see that as well. <laughs> oh, you do them well, but you're, okay. That's, well, we should post more of that because that's actually interesting. Um, all right, this is a slide about me. I'm not gonna go through the whole thing. The main interesting part here is my Twitter handle. So if I say something that doesn't make sense, you can tweet me uh, and we can talk about it. Um, the other thing I'll point out, a lot of what we're gonna be talking about, this is uh, research that I'm doing as part of my Master's of Science in Human Factors and System Safety. So that's where this stuff comes from. Um, I wanna talk a little bit uh, about Lund. That's where I'm getting um, my, my Master's. Um, you might have heard of it. Uh, if you've heard of John Allspa, he did, uh, he was the CTO of Etsy for a long time, also Velocity Comp, he was a program chair there. Um, he was one of the first IT people at Lund uh, to get uh, his masters in this area. It's kind of funny, he's also like the first like IT person that went there and all of the, the cla his colleagues and my classmates too, they're like air traffic controllers, nuclear power plant engineers, people like that. They always ask us to fix their laptops when we're doing stuff because they think there were that kind of IT support, which is kind of funny. Um, but I wanted to call this out because what we're starting to see, you, you see Nora and Casey at the bottom, we're starting to see more and more people following John and myself on this road of lo looking at sort of human factors and system safety as it pertains to IT. So that's actually really interesting because there's a growing group of sort of what we con would consider practitioners, which are all of us, but also taking the research view of it and trying to mesh those two worlds together. So we're gonna spend uh, about half our time today talking about the research because there's some really interesting findings there. And then we're gonna talk about what you can do to kind of improve uh, based on those findings, uh, your world and life as it relates to uh, retrospectives and artifacts. So I wanted to start with the research question. This is direct from the thesis. In industrial practice, in what ways and to what purpose are the artifacts produced in a post-incident review process utilized by a software development and operations company? And of course, because this is academia, this took like four weeks to get this sentence down. What am I really asking, or what are we really looking at? What do we actually do with all of that paperwork and all of those reports and all of those JIRA tickets that we write up in a postmortem? What do, as an industry, what do we actually do with that? And then of course, okay, no but for reals, right? Because a lot of us talk in the hallway track or get up on stage and talk about, oh, you know, when we have an incident, this is what we do. But is that actually what we do? And I had a lot of experience working with clients before I started doing the research where they would say, oh, we do this and we do this and we do this and we're not getting the outcome that we want. And I would go look at what they're doing. It's like, oh, that's because you think you're doing that, but you're actually not doing that. And there were a lot of cases of that. So that's kind of what prompted this question. So I want to position the research just so you sort of understand in the landscape where it is. So there's sort of this, this is going to be a Venn diagram. There's this idea of sort of operational retrospective. So this are, these are things that we think about road and nuclear, airplanes crashing, uh, trains crashing, that kind of uh, retrospective. This idea of organizational learning, so how do organizations learn uh, from themselves, from other organizations? And then also IT and agile retrospectives. So that this is the standard, you know, we have, there's actually two types that we were looking at. Um, the first being agile retrospective, so at the end of a sprint, that type of retro. And then also um, big bang IT project retrospectives. So one of the ones that comes to mind, the California DMV where, where I am, they spent, you know, 
a billion dollars on a new DMV system that it took them 10 years to implement and they didn't implement it. So they might do a retrospective, which is slightly different than your sprint retrospective, uh, unless your sprints are five years long. So really though, there's some overlap areas. And the one thing that I'll actually call out is if you look at the, the areas of research that have been done, IT security is actually the only overlap between operational retrospectives and then the work that we do. There is published research on what do security people do when they are responding to security incidents. And I think the reason for this is because IT incidents usually have a cost associated with them, usually a pretty big one. Um, and so there was some research interest in this. But really what I was looking at was sort of the kind of right in the middle of all of these things not necessarily security, though we'll talk a little bit about that because that turned out to be kind of interesting. So if I were to put this all in one picture, um, what we're really looking at, and I only call this out because the sort of like incident outage and, and, and the meeting itself, so we all get to, there's an outage of some sort, we get together, we have a meeting about it, that was all a black box for this. I, I wasn't really interested in what, what people did during that meeting. I was very interested in this stuff that falls out of it and then how people use those things. So those blue lines, the real question at the end of the day is, how do they use it and does it feed back in any meaningful way into production or into the next incident? Do we, we say we learn from that, but do we really? And, and if so, how? So the first part that I'm gonna talk about was the first phase, which was a, uh, an industry survey that I did. Um, and actually I think some people in the room were kind enough to, to send it out and tweet it out because uh, we got a, a number of really good results. And I want to share this with you because um, the survey really actually informed the organizational research. But this is one of those things where it's like us asking ourselves about ourselves. And so there's kind of some interesting findings in there. So real briefly, who, and I know this is hard to read, but I'll, I'll point out the highlights. Who, so who took the survey? The, uh, the two big groups were operations engineers and engineering management. And it's interesting that, that developers actually didn't take this survey. So it's mostly our group I if you're in operations or maybe you graduated to, to management of some sort. Those are the two big groups of people that took it. Uh, what size company? So there was a big chunk of, of sort of mid-size, 100 to 500 people, and then greater than 2,000. So it's interesting, a lot of people actually, uh, a, a full like third almost, worked at really large organizations. Now, one of the first questions I asked was, what do you call, in, in post-incident analysis events, a really long phrase, because we call it a lot of different things, right? We call it learning review, post-mortem, right? So I asked people what they call it. Um, any guesses on which one won by such a, like a huge margin? Yeah, it was post-mortem, which I found a little surprising, but yeah, by a wide, wide, that's 60%. Uh, so they called it uh, a post-mortem, not a retrospective. One of the other questions I asked is how often do you hold uh, the, how, whatever you call it, how often do you do it one per month? Um, and I found it interesting that actually 15% never hold them per month, like don't hold a retro at all. So maybe their systems are stable and, and nobody ever deploys and they just, uh, everything just works all the time. Um, I think the other interesting thing about this data, so you have, you have people that are, you know, most people do them maybe about uh, once a month or, or tending towards once a week. One of the interesting things is that this group at the bottom, they do two or more a week. Now that's kind of interesting, and, and I didn't dig into why, because there's two possibilities, right? Their systems are incredibly unstable, and they have outages all the time, or they post-mortem tiny things. Right, they're, they're constantly looking at them and, and maybe the process that they use is nimble and smaller and easy to, to do, so they do it more often. Sort of like the idea behind continuous delivery, right? Ship more, uh, ship more often that makes it less painful. So that was actually one of, one of the kind of interesting findings, that there's a group of us, about 15%, that do them really often. So this one question was how long after the incident do you hold the event? And this one was interesting uh, for me, because I um, sort of think everyone was maybe lying, and I, I'm not sure. So 60% said they do it one to three days after the event, one to three working days after the event. And I'd be curious, like, just when you're thinking about this, for those of you that do retros, does this jive with, with do you get them done? 
within three days after uh, three working days after the event. Um, most people say they do. Uh, that hasn't been my anecdotal observations, but that was that's what what we what we think. And the last bit of the survey, um, the graphs that I'll show you. I know again these are kind of hard to see, um, but but they sort of serve as the foundation for the findings that we're going to talk about next. Um, which of the following items are created or recorded? Again, this is hard to see, but I'm going to point out the two top two items, 90% list of remediation items. So in other words, the vast, vast majority of people doing retrospectives, they are doing them to create a list of bug fixes or process changes or tickets that they need to do. Next one that's really high is event timeline. So we uh, find that really important and we create timelines. The other one that I'll call out near the bottom at 27% is individual narratives. So what this is saying is only about a quarter of retrospectives create space for our individual narratives or the narratives of the participants in the incident. Now that'll come, remember that because we'll come back to that. It turns out that that's interesting and also important. So what are were some notable uh, things about the survey that I found kind of in, in that data. So this was answers to the question, which of the following items are created or recorded? So in other words, at an in, uh, retrospective, you're writing, you're recording certain things. Um, I had not ever thought of this or seen it before, but regulatory impact. So in other words, sure, if you're a regulated industry of some sort, I get that, but they recorded sort of the impact to the who was regulating them and what they were going to have to talk to the regulator about as it related to this incident. So that was kind of interesting. Um, one of the writing answers was, this is extremely non-formal at my current place of, uh, of employment. One of the other questions was, do you use a template and do you use a facilitator? And a good 40% of people don't use a template and a good third of people don't use a facilitator when they do retrospectives. So this suggests how repeatable are whatever you do, how repeatable are your retrospectives? It's an interesting question. And finally, I think one of my favorite answers, but also a sad answer, is uh, they record blame and fault, which is like a hashtag sad face. Uh, I mean, you know, if you're going to blame, you might as well record it, right? Um, so there were some interesting themes, too, that I noticed. So numerous surveys pointed out there is no root cause. But then they prompted people to use five whys. And if you have heard of five whys, five whys is a way to figure out the root cause. So I thought this was interesting. They're like, th there's a root cause is not a thing. But to find out the thing that we want, use five whys. It's like, well, OK, that's odd. Um, a number of templates. So these are retrospective templates that people sent that they use at their, their their um, organization, ask and talk about luck. Where do we get lucky? Which I think is an interesting thing to talk about in a retrospective. Where do, wh where do we get lucky in this incident? Okay. Um, I think this is also interesting. Numerous templates highlighted it, uh, and prompted discussions are around preventing recurrence. So in other words, this illustrates that this is really top of mind for all of us at least from an industry perspective. We do these seemingly to prevent recurrence. And we'll come back to that because that's, that's an uh, interesting nugget. And finally, again, uh, one of my favorite writing answers. I'm the only one with enough sense to think that this is important information. Um, I, I get they're not bitter at all, I guess. So let's summarize this. In terms of the the um, survey and the more importantly the the artif artifact templates that I got, so incident event templates would you call them retro or whatever? They serve different purposes, so there are different types of templates, and you can actually infer by looking at your template kind of what type uh, and what you think is important based on what that template looks like. So the most common is re recording the event just a record of that event. So it's going to include basically all the discussions, probably the timeline, that sort of thing. And it's what you would expect probably goes on a wiki page or something like that if you do th that. Um, again, most common type. The second one is to facilitate the event. 
So there were a large number of templates that actually were big sets of instructions on how to do the retrospective with the team. And they had sort of things where you could fill stuff in, but the goal of that template was to basically be able to give it to someone else and have them run that retro and get something useful out of it. So it wasn't as important to them to record what happened there. It was more facilitating the, the event and learning from it. And then the final one is sort of what I call the index card. And there were more, th this was the, the smallest batch. But basically, it was information that was almost like, uh, if you've ever uh, learned how to use a card catalog in a library, it was almost like a card catalog where you could look at an incident, find it, and then it would point you to other pieces of information. And it was very interesting. It was almost like a summary document. It's like, okay, this happened, here's the date, and here's all the JIRA tickets we filed, and that's basically it. It was just sort of a, a signpost on where to go. So phase two, bring this back up, right? Phase one was that little kind of just looking at what, what we collected uh, and what we, we submitted it sort of as a, a group of people as an industry. And so the second phase is really, okay, let's ignore that. Uh, that's interesting. But then let's look at, at what these green arrows are. So how, uh, how those people in those incidents later use sort of what I call primary artifacts and then secondary artifacts in an organization in their context. So to do that, I'm going to introduce to you a company called DevOps Co. Um, and uh, what I can tell, this is a real company, by the way. Uh, I can't tell you it is for, for uh, um, research reasons. The protocol doesn't allow me to do that. But I can tell you about them. So they are a well-known company. If I could tell you, you would know who they were. Everyone would know who they are. Um, they're a business-to-consumer company, um, and they're available in multiple markets all over the world. So as a, they have consumers all over the world. You can buy their product all over the world. They are cloud-native, uh, so they do all their stuff in the cloud. Um, they uh, enjoy sort of, th this, this is hard to explain, but uh, the way I said it was, they enjoy mindshare in both the technology industry space and the conference circuit space. So there was a running joke about some conferences are just the DevOps co-conference, right? Because so many of their people speak there. Um, but they also enjoy sort of um, mind share in the financial press as well, which is actually kind of an interesting, interesting aspect. And they're known for st uh, stability and reliability. So uh, again, they, they are uh, what we would consider a DevOps unicorn, if you've heard that phrase. So let's look at what they do real kind of briefly and quickly. Um, incident response via familiar mechanisms, so they get together on a Slack channel or open a bridge, they do kind of that uh, when they have an incident. Um, they also, pretty common, centralized group for coordinating incident management. So that's, incident happens, are we gonna do a retro, how do we do a retro? There's a central group that handles that. Um, they do something they call sync meetings, but they're not formal retrospectives. This was kind of an interesting thing. So in other words, that central team will actually meet with all of the other teams and see uh, before a formal retro, they'll s they call them sync meetings. They'll sync up with them to make sure that they're sort of processing the data from the incident and, and uh, having their own meetings at a team level. They will do what they call an after-incident review meeting, though not always. There's, there actually a, is a bar for that meeting, and the bar is set by this team, and the, the bar is basically, would we get anything out of having a meeting that we didn't get from all these sync meetings? And a lot of times, the answer is no, and in fact, it's increasingly less so. They have less of these meetings because they're getting so good at basically doing the retro kind of asynchronously. Um, there's an interesting tension sort of in remediation. So what I mean by that is development teams can basically implement the remediations or not. They push that down to the development teams. Um, and so, uh, you know, an a they could say you should fix this bug and the dev teams could say, nope, not gonna do it. Um, one of the developers actually said, sometimes we'll take another outage. We don't care, that's better for us. It's kind of interesting. That also creates though a tension with this central team where they will often push back if a certain team keeps having outages, because it means they're not taking that, that prioritization seriously. Or if another team has realized this is a really bad practice, you shouldn't do that, then they'll say, hey, actually, you, you should care about this because we have a bunch of experience with this other team. And then there was an interesting kind of thing about categories and filing, searching, and sorting incidents. They do this manually. They actually have a person that curates these. They found 
They tried tagging and a bunch of different ways to find that data later, and they found the only real way that you can do it. A lot of people say, oh, let's AI this, let's big data this problem. And they said, yeah, that's funny. If you've got enough incidents to train AI or big data, you've got a different problem than searching and sorting. Uh, so they were like, it doesn't work in that context. So what artifacts did I look at? So they create, like probably many of you do, an incident tracking ticket. So when an incident happens, they create a ticket. Humorously enough, they said they hate creating a ticket. It's like the worst way to express that information, but it's the only way that is like consistent across the organization. Like every team knows about tickets and knows what to do with them, so that's what they do. Create an incident tracking ticket. And then they'll do type and team specific sub tickets. So these are things like, oh, these are the remediation items that you need to do. They'll track those and they'll relate it back to this uh, incident ticket. In fact, in their language when they talk about things, they call them INC tickets. So they'll say, oh, you know, how, how are you doing on INC 3562? They do something, they make heavy use of a QA doc, what they call a Q&A doc. Um, and they, it, it's become built into their sort of culture that they sort of asynchronously do these uh, retrospectives. That sync meeting is really about the syncing up the asynchronous work that they've done. And they do it via this Q&A doc and they're able to basically get high uh, resolution answers just doing it sort of offline, which is kind of interesting. They'll do what they call an after incident report if, they, if it's important enough. And what is interesting about this is this is what they call this an above the fold reading experience. So in other words, it's a single piece of paper. You know, it's one of those you could, you could put it in the, in the bathroom stalls and read it, you know, all over, you know, whenever. It really is designed to have a headline. It might have an inch one interesting graph, so it is graphical and it grabs your attention. But they spend a lot of time, they spent a lot of time learning how to write these. So they're engaging to people reading them and they communicate the right things. They're starting to do something called self-service retrospectives. So as DevOps people, you know, we always say, well, you, you uh, build it, you own it, you run it, right? Well, they say, yeah, and you also postmortem it. So more and more of even mid-level incidents, they actually say, I want you to do a self-service retro, and then we'll take that and kind of loop back around. Would, and, and here's the thing that is interesting about this. They're seeing really good success with this. They're actually seeing better success than when they had a big meeting and got people together. One of the other artifacts that I thought was fascinating, so you think, oh, you know, remediation tickets, QA doc, you know, that stuff falls out of it. They actually have had conference talks fall out of their incidents. And it's not just conference talks that they go present externally, they do that, but also internal conference talks. Um, so they will take an incident and, and do like internal teaching events on that. And that has been, you know, an artifact, if you will. It's what I call the secondary artifact, which is kind of of an interesting use case. So let's go through the findings. That was sort of what they do. Let's talk about the findings. Different teams use the artifacts differently. So this may seem somewhat obvious, but I think what was interesting to me is the ways in which the different teams use them differently. So I was privileged to be able to talk to a set of developers and a set of operations people, and a set of security people. And what I found is that the operations team and the security team really use these artifacts to refine their processes and to do trend analysis. Those are things they care a lot about. Refine processes and then tr trying to figure out the trends in the system. Developers, on the other hand, actually don't care really about either of those things. They don't use it for that purpose. Um, they use it for architectural changes uh, and, and sort of how to design like a refactor. They'll go back and look at incidents. They also use it in architectural arguments and discussions. So one of the stories they had is a new manager came by and they were like, why are you doing this? And they were like, oh, you know, I'm not entirely sure. And it turns out that they were able to trace back that design decision, which didn't make a lot of sense if you just joined the team, to a set of incidents. And they gave that to the manager and then the manager's like, oh, I get it. Okay, cool. Now their security team, which I also think is interesting, uh, it's not s related exactly to postmortems, but treats security as a product. So the security team offers a product, if you will, an internal product to the company. Um, they actually use it, they have a product manager. They use the incidents to drive their feature backlog 
for the security products they offer to the rest of the company. It's an interesting use case. Now, here's the other really uh, kind of thing that didn't make a lot of sense. I, to a T, asked every engineer, okay, in the middle of an incident, do you go look up, up other incidents? To a T, they all said no. So in the middle of an incident, I don't look, I don't go look at old incidents, I don't go look at tickets. Then you would talk to them for the full hour, and every single one of them told me a story about they went back and looked for a ticket during an incident. I don't know why there's this dichotomy, this mental dichotomy of we don't use them during an incident, but they do, because they all told me stories about how they did that. One of the interesting ones is uh, I talked to a development manager, and uh, she said, I will use the incident because I don't generally work an incident, but I want to be with my team when they're working an incident because I think that's important. So she would search incidents that, you know, sh she, she manages, managed the team for a really long time, so she would search for incidents that she thought might be helpful to help the effort. And I thought that was kind of an interesting use case, even though she wasn't in the trenches really anymore doing that. So um, one of the probably big uh, findings, so we're going to go through the, the three big findings of the organizational study. Um, and, th and this is where I think we slow down a little bit, and, and you should think a lot about sort of how you use sort of what comes out of a retrospective and, and how that sort of feeds back into your system. So the interesting finding is artef artifacts aren't the end game. They're really a means to an end. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is th this organization goes, they do postmortems to get better at doing postmortems and better at learning about their system. They really couldn't care less about remediation items or the Q&A document or the documentation or any of it. They do the process to get better at it. It's almost like master chefs, like they cook to get better at it, but they don't eat the food. They don't eat the whole meal at the end. Hopefully we get to, but they don't. They do it to get better. The other thing that they use it for uh, is they use it to refine their own processes around this. So this was also interesting. I was only with this organization for three months. They had changed their process twice and were getting, um, I shouldn't say change. They refined it twice in a substantive way that they were testing out they were conducting experiments and getting better at it in a three-month period, in the period of a quarter. I really like this quote from one of the operations engineers. It's kind of strategic accountability more than tactical accountability. So what he's saying here is that remediation items are tactical accountability, right? You, th we had an incident. I'm going to have you fix it. That's a tactical thing. He's like, that doesn't really work here. We don't believe in that. And so what we practice is more strategic accountability. One of the other uh, operations engineers said uh, one of the internally, this one uh, internally presented tech talk was about identifying not necessarily the causes of our incidents, but the hazards that have been present during all of our incidents. And that's a subtle difference, right? Again, they're not interested so much in the cause. They really want to know about um, the, the uh, hazards that were present. So uh, finding uh, they artifacts reveal hot spots and distant but connected components. So what this means is where there's smoke, there's fire. They use it to identify where there's smoke in the system. The other thing is they find they found uh, that and the security team gave a great example of a team that was overseas and had a security problem and didn't know what to do, and it caused a security incident. So in other words, they were able to find out those two teams are connected somehow, but nobody really knew it, and it took an incident to find that out. So that was an interesting finding. And sort of finally, finding uh, artifacts are used to create and communicate context, this idea of tribal knowledge and culture, loosely, culture is a really loaded term. I like this quote, when an incident is happening you're in and you're in the thick of it, things are still breaking, context can be really powerful. So they take context really, it's really important to them. I would point out, uh, just briefly, it was interesting, discussions of tribal knowledge as the group got bigger went down and uh, context went up. So in other words, we, they would talk about tribal knowledge if they were talking about in their team or it maybe in their organizational division, but when they're talking company-wide, they would sh shift from tribal knowledge, which is often very implicit and tacit, to context because context requires that I set a context for you, I have to communicate with you, so there's a little more effort there. That was an interesting trade-off. Now, I'm going to run through this quickly. Got about five minutes left here. I'm going to bring up something called the Rasmussen Triangle. And um, 
this was a guy who studied Three Mile Island. Um, and so the boundaries of the triangle are boundary of economic freedom, or f sorry, economic failure, boundary of unacceptable workload, and then uh, performance or acceptable risk. And what this is basically saying is across the economic boundary, it would be too expensive. We wouldn't do it. It would cost too much money, right? Across the acceptable workload, that's humans are inherently sort of lazy. We try to optimize our work as much as we can. So uh, that across that boundary, it would take too much work. We wouldn't do it. Too many processes, too many rules, that sort of thing. And of course, uh, across the failure boundary or the acceptable risk is, is an accident. Now, there are something called pressure gradients where these are flows in this uh, a triangle that sort of push the system towards a boundary. So a w the business, cheaper, better, faster, is how they often say, the business is pushing one direction. We are often uh, trying to do maximum work, least effort, so we're pushing it the system that direction. Where are we all pushing the system? Towards that accident boundary, right? So his argument was, he called this the discretionary space. His argument was, Organizations that get really good at this explore, that's the word he used, the discretionary space. They're able to have basically good coverage across that entire boundary. And so what's that, what, um, what is relevant about that here is that the organization that is a high performer, they use the retrospective process to make tools and processes to explore the space. That's their job. Make their engineers good at exploring all the parts of the space. Find par you know, components in this space that we didn't know were connected but actually are connected. That sort of thing. All right, so how do we do this in our organizations? We'll take away one for you, hopefully from the talk when you go back uh, to, to wherever, whatever your day job is. So time, space, and I included the word sincerity is required. So what do I mean by that? Well, basically, if you don't hold your retros in less than 72 hours, you might as well not hold them at all. So that's an interesting finding. Um, or you might do something called multi-phase retros. And you can ask me about those later, or maybe in open space if you want to know what I mean by that. Invoking the space is super important. Uh, and so that means when you bring people together, um, setting the connotation expectation. It's so important that some people encode their, their um, code that in their template document. Uh, preparation matters. So the sync meeting. So a lot for, for the high performing organization, the meeting is not where they do the thing where they figure out what's on the timeline. They don't get into a room and say, okay, let's construct the timeline. That's a waste of everybody's time. So come prepared. Um, for companies uh, really benefiting re retros, there are, they are not about what we often think they're about. So they're not about searching for a root cause because that doesn't exist anyway. They're not about remediation items. This is probably the biggest thing that people may find challenging. They're actually not about remediation items. And they're not necessarily about convergence. Um, so what's interesting here is this a picture of what, it, what does it look like he's doing? So what I mean by convergence is you can have two different views in the system. Both of them are important. One person can see this, but of course, that's actually what's happening, <laughs> right? So it's important to provide that. Um, finally, I want to talk uh, the last finding in three acts. This is a tweet exchange with Mark Embriaco. We were talking about do you call it learning review or retrospective? You don't have to read the whole tweet. But he says, I prefer learning review. And I said, I also like learning review. And very qu quickly, it degenerated into, don't make us have to post more to this thread, Twitter thread, Mark. And he was like, go debrief yourself, Paul. Um, so the point I want to make is blameless and blame aware are table stakes now. If you are doing retros and there's this sort of blame and pointing and finger you know, accountability, it's about accountability, and there's no sense of blame aware or blamelessness, uh, you also might as well not run them. Um, I'm not going to go through this since I'm slightly over, but I will point this out. There's an interesting kind of grid of blameful versus blameless and then low investments in postmortem versus high investments. The high performers are in the quadrant you would expect, but one of the interesting th ones is I see common problem management. These are enterprises and organizations that hold people accountable, so they're blameful, but they're incredibly high investment. They're incredibly costly. And that's also not where you want to be either. Uh, that's all I got.
Uh, last thing I'll mention real quickly, if you find this stuff interesting, there's a conference uh, that we're putting on about resilient engineering, resilient organizations. Uh, check it out. And I think it's lunchtime, so let's go have lunch. <laughs>